sign for all of the lovely demonstrations that you all set up. It really is a pleasure to welcome you and thank you for coming to the first annual, we hope, um, Astronomy Night at the University of Vermont in collaboration with the Vermont Astronomical Society and certainly this evening also with the American Astronomical Society and I'll say a, a word more about that. There's plenty of seats over here actually and please feel free to come around. Um, I don't like <laughs> I just want to be class. I know, I know. Give a wave. I also want to acknowledge um, David Hammond, who um, is our instrument person in the physics department and was the one who has put a great deal of effort. <coughs> Me, I'm my voice, into um, setting up, taking the five telescope out of its boxes, tuning it up, dusting it off, and, um, and putting it in condition for it to be shown uh, this evening. I don't think David's here to receive this applause, but we certainly, uh, or thanks, but we certainly want uh, to acknowledge him. So, again, thank you for all for coming, and uh, we hope to uh, have another astronomy night next year, and so uh, please, uh, please keep it in mind and look for it in the papers. So it's also my pleasure this evening to introduce uh, Professor A.G. Davis Phillip, who is an astronomer, um, an editor, who's also an educator like some of the rest of us, um, having taught astronomy and physics, he got his undergraduate uh, degree from Union College, his master's degree from New Mexico State University, and his PhD from Case Institute of Technology. And he will talk to us about large telescopes, uh, past, present, and future. And he comes to us as a Shapley lecturer. Harlow uh, Shapley is uh, pictured um, in the slide um, of the endowed Harlow Shapley lectureship of the American Astronomical Society. I think I did it. Thank you very much. So one of Harlow Shapley's major accomplishments was to move the center of everything from the sun to the center of the galaxy, which he did by studying the distribution of modern clusters, and that is his picture up there. I never met him personally, but I did intersect with him a number of points. For two weeks, I owned his entire library, and when he died, a bookseller in Massachusetts got possession of the library, and he offered it in bits and pieces. And I thought that was interesting enough, so I put in an offer for the entire thing. And we shook hands on it, and that was a deal. And then two weeks later, he very apologetically called me. And in the Shapley family, there was a big uh, schism. And the part of the family that sold off the books against the part of the family that wanted to keep them. And this part won, so that was it. And then uh, some years ago, there was a symposium honoring Carl Shapley. Now, what I'll be doing tonight is, well, I brought two more things just to show you about the Shapley program. Uh, here is a plot showing the number of visits. My records go back to 68. Uh, so you can see there's a big increase. The maximum was 132 in 1985. And this, uh, the inflation rate was maxed about here. And so the Shapley fund earned uh, a pile of money. And since then, the interest rates have been falling, and the society's interest rate for their investment, I was horrified to find, was 3%. And so uh, at this level, there are only 27 visits, and uh, I took over here, so I'm trying to, try to uh, push it back up. And uh, I made one more plot. This shows the number. 
number of visits done by each uh, lecturer. And so there is uh, one guy out here, Alan Meltzer at RBI, and he's done 61. But the mean is a dozen so uh, So what I'll do tonight in this talk, the first part will be done by slides. And in the early 1980s, I was lucky enough to be the only person to observe on the four largest telescopes at that time in the world. So I have pictures of those telescopes and mainly the Soviet Union six meter uh, reflector. And at the end of that, I'll switch to overheads. And since then, the whole picture has changed uh, drastically. And I think by the year 2000, the six meter will not even be on the list of the 10 largest telescopes. So the second part of the talk, I will tell you about some of the other projects and some other telescopes that have been built, which are uh, more larger. So if uh, the projector can be turned on, we yeah. do that here. And the lights um, off. Here is the largest refractor in the world at Yerkes. 
and it still is. Uh, in the early days, it was easier or better to build, uh, grind a large lens, and the science of doing that was further advanced. And in the early days, uh, there was a metal called spectrum metal, and it was uh, made up of a number of very expensive metals. And so it was very expensive to make a large mirror. And it was also harder to fix the surface in the correct parabolic uh, shape. And speculum metal does not have a high reflectivity. And so uh, if you had a mirror and a lens at that time, the mirror would outperform. But nowadays, as far as when we're talking of uh, telescopes with six foot diameters, uh, you can't imagine making a lens that big. Up, it would sag under its own weight. Uh, it just, uh, and also, you can see the glass would get very thick, and glass absorbs light, so it has too much glass. That as well. All right, so now we're uh, dropping down to Chile, and the United States runs the Cerro Tololo Inter American Observatory, and uh, here's the four meter telescope, which is the uh, in the 80s. That was the third largest telescope. There is another four meter at Chile, but, I mean in uh, Kidney, but this one is, uh, I think, an inch larger in diameter. So. And that's a close up of that four meter. Uh, this is interesting. One day I got up and there was this very nice sun dog phenomenon. And so I hopped in the little vehicle that I give all the astronomers. Drove to the one place where it rained the four meter. So it's a good job. But anyway, it's not. And here's the inside. And uh, so this is the right ascension axis. And there's a motor down here. And with, as you know, an equatorial mount, if you have a motor running at the correct speed, that will compensate for the Earth's rotation. So this telescope can be aimed at the star. And it will pretty well keep on track. You still, if you're taking long exposure, you have to have a guiding box because refraction and various other things will gradually move the star off. But basically, it tracks. And then uh, another axis here is a declination axis, so the telescope then swings up and down. And uh, by setting the position on the console, then the telescope can be pointed to any position at the sky. This is my first trip to Chile, and it was a really interesting trip. You can see this wheel in the middle on. And um, what we did was we uh, waited for quite a time, and the plane took off about four hours late. And I heard a noise, and I looked out the right side window, and we did, all of them were just covered with planes. And so what happened, the entire tire assembly burned up, and uh, that gouge was a foot deep. And so it was really silly. They sent out about 20 or 25 taxis. And we all got off and we went back to the airport and waited another four hours for a second plane. And it's sort of hard to believe. But as we took off, I heard a noise and the uh, right tires went. This time it wasn't uh, as fatal. It, uh, there were just flat tires. So, but again, we had to go back and wait another time. And finally, we got to in Chile, they have uh, these vultures, and they are almost tame in the sense what happens to cooks, in fact, I think the next picture, uh, give them meat, and so they come up and get their daily meal. Okay, uh, the next telescope that I used was the uh, multi-mirror telescope. This was in Tucson, Arizona, and it's six 70-inch mirrors range in a circle, and so that ends up uh, being, uh, actually that was the, the, uh, kit, the cerebral was fourth largest. This ended up being the third largest telescope. And what's happening here is when you set the thing up and you go to a star field, you can see that each, uh, there, there's six images of everything. And so when you first set it up, the mirrors are not necessarily lined up correctly. And uh, the next picture shows the control box. And see there's six switches here. And 
And so uh, there was a lady operator, and she very quickly uh, fiddled with those switches. And then uh, the six images combined uh, to one. But that was a very nice telescope. All right, this is uh, Hale Observatories, uh, headquarters for Palomar Observatories, five meters, and there's the dome. There's the uh, five meter from the back, from the front. And again, it's just like the four meter, as I said, you know, the right ascension axis here and the stagnation axis. All right, so now we go to the Caucasus. And uh, what I had to do was to fly into Moscow, and then you take a plane to Minerali, Vladi. And it's about a three and a half hour ride by truck to the observatory. And this was the first place from the road that you got a sight of the film. Now, it was, uh, you know, the Soviet era. And so I had to be given a pass. And so here's my name in Russian, and I was able to be there on those dates. And when you got to the gate of the observatory, it was just like going to a foreign country. There was a gate box and a bar, and you had to show the pass to get in. This is the library, and uh, here's the action. And astronomers in the group will notice there's something peculiar right across here. These are all apshades, and this is what we recognize. This is something peculiar. Uh, what was going on in those days, the Soviet Union subscribed to one copy of the action for the entire country. They then reprinted it, and that's what all these are. And whatever this date was, uh, that's the date they finally agreed to abide by the copyright rules. And then they bought some hundreds of copies and sent them to the observatory. There is a, a little astronomical city. There are some like 50 PhD astronomers who live there, and so these are their apartments. And at, in the early 80s, the, there were pluses and minuses. If these people lived in Moscow, their apartments would be very small. So they gained, they had uh, really nice living quarters. But the price they paid was they, the, the nearest uh, village was Zelenskaya, which is just a little farming uh, community. So for culture or education or anything, they were really left out. But uh, anyway, that's how they did it. And uh, we weren't that many people. There were children, so they had their own kindergarten. Here's a little uh, bus that goes up from the office to the top of the mountain. And here's a sign showing some of the uh, dangers. And there were times, there was one time when I, I didn't see rocks falling, but I remember one time we were driving down and we had to weave our way quite a bit through a rock wall. These are the four universities, uh, Moscow, Leningrad, Rostov, and Gorky, which uh, were behind the uh, building of the telescope. This is uh, from the telescope looking back. And this is the dormitory and dining room, kitchen and so on. This is storage. This is a dome that's not associated with the observatory. It belongs to Kazakhstan. And, uh, and that's it. There are no other telescopes on the mountain. And it's funny because normally, if you have a big telescope, you want a fair number of smaller telescopes to do preliminary work. And uh, the story I heard was at one time, a group of astronomers approached for the powers of be, we should put a one meter three-meter uh, telescope on the mountain. And the response was, the site is not good enough to put a one-meter telescope. And the problem, with, the major problem with this telescope is that the number of nights, you get only a third that you can work. And uh, I was granted 24 nights, and I got eight. So I was right on schedule. But uh, that's the big problem, because you have all the astronomers that are granted a certain amount of time to do their project, and you get only a third of what you were after. So it means you never finish, and next year you reapply, and meanwhile there are new projects coming in. So it's a real problem. All right, 
right, this is looking the other way that from the dorm drive up to the uh, dome. This object is a crane that was used to move the mirror and the heavy machinery in through the slip. And it's still there even to this day. And the problem is that it would cost a lot of money to take it down, which they don't have, so it just remains. And this is coming up uh, into the main entrance of the <coughs> This is Glory in the Soviet Science. Now, my collaborator, Nikolai Samos, uh, had a theory about the cows. <laughs> and I forget how it went, but anyway, uh, if the cows were grazing above the dome, the weather would be fair. And if they grazed way down, it would be cloudy. And uh, we had full of clear and cloudy weather. And as far as I can see, the cows were able to do snow correlation. <laughs> All right, here is the uh, dome with the slit open. And this was in May, but May in the Caucasus, you still can have snowstorms. <coughs> this was the second time I climbed that crane. The first time, it looked clear, and I climbed up, and it was pretty high. It takes a bit of time to do so. And as I started climbing, I noticed there was a little uh, bit of fog. And by the time I got to the top, I couldn't see the dome anymore. So <laughs> And this was nice. The, usually, as soon as I said the night was over, the night assistant would cover uh, the mirror, close the dome, that was it. And I just got used to that. And so this night, Samus and I were walking down the road back to the door, and um, I just for some reason turned around, and I found the dome slit was still open, so it made a very nice picture. You can see the telescope. When you go to Kid Peak, our Sarah Lowell, you are given two keys. One key is the personal key to your own dorm room. The other key opens everything else. <laughs> Here you can see it's a different story altogether. Let me go to the next picture. There's the key case. So every room had its own key. And if I wanted to go to dark room one, I had to go downstairs to the guard and get uh, the, that key. Luckily, there's an observer's room where you spend a lot of time. Thursday night there, there, playing chess, eating, or, or whatever. And the key to that door had been lost, so that was only so much. And uh, I, I ended up corrupting Stalin. He's a communist, and uh, for good reason. I mean, his whole education, all his benefits came through uh, the party, so you can understand. And uh, when you go into the door, there were two guards. And they wanted to see your passing. We I mean, were the observers. And the thing that struck me was, I was the first American ever to observe on the telescope. And so I knew, everybody on that mountain knew who I was. And so the first night, I showed my pass. But the second night, I, you know, having reasoned this out, I just refused. And they let me in. And the third night was really interesting, because Samos refused to show his pass, and he got it. <laughs> Now, one nice effect is on the ceiling of the uh, ground floor, there is a glassworks in Riga, and they have put in glass all the constellations. And I don't have, uh, I have pictures of all, I think I have three or four uh, pictures here. Okay, here's a diagram of a telescope. And as are most big telescopes nowadays, they are not built out to, I mean, uh, equatorially. And the reason is that to build a large equatorial telescope, it gets very massive. And as the weight increases, the danger of some part of it flexing. And you can imagine if you have an optic axis, and uh, not part of the telescope shifts by even a millimeter, that's going to ruin your focus. So the defense is you make those members stronger, heavier, and that makes the problem worse. And so if you go to an altitude azimuth mount, 
then what you're doing is your the weight is set here. Uh, the telescope will rotate in azimuth. And then really it's not like a two-dimensional telescope. Really you're just moving it back and forth. And so that means uh, you can build it with much less material and still make it uh, rigid. There are some penalties. With an equatorial, as I mentioned before, I can point it at a star and the telescope will track. This telescope, there's no way it will track. Yeah. So what you do then is you build a computer interface and some 15 times a second, a little pulse is sent and the uh, equations relating out to that to the right ascension declination are used and they send a little correction. So the telescope will track and it does it all right. But as you move up and you get to the zenith, these little corrections get to be really major corrections. And you finally reach a point that you can't uh, move the massive telescope fast enough to be corrected. And so what this results in, there's a little cone of about five degrees radius around the zenith. And you just cannot move the telescope to that position. And by this means, you have to plan your observatory night a little differently. Just make sure that any time exposure is not going to enter um, that region. A second effect is with the equatorial, if you look through the uh, telescope, you will find, say, north is up. It's always going to be up. No matter where you are in the sky, if you look through that eyepiece, north is up. With the altitude azimuth, the field is rotating. And it was really humorous because every time we went to a new position in the sky, uh, there were three of us uh, working the chart. Uh, we had uh, TV monitors which would look at the field of view, and uh, we had the chart, say an M92, and we were each trying to locate in various ways, trying to find what is the orientation. And it does, you know, in a couple minutes we had it solved. But it's, uh, All right, here's the plate holder. There's a prime focus cage where sometimes an observer will actually get in and ride with the telescope. And uh, you put the uh, plate holder in here. And uh, if you look closely, you'll see there's something odd about this plate holder. There are two eyepieces. And so what's going on is you have to correct to make sure the, ro the plate holder is rotated in the right Sense, so it keeps up with the rotation of the field. And uh, you check on that by looking through those two. And then you can keep one to check with the telescope. <coughs> and I never took a direct plate, but Samus had. And he said that the rotation is solved very, very well. So you hardly ever have to correct for that. And mainly you use uh, one of the eyepieces in the conventional guiding sense to make sure the star stays on the cross here. All right, there the telescope is horizontal, and there's a little ladder so the observer can climb in to the uh, prime focus stage. Here the telescope uh, is, uh, SSSR. Here's the uh, control panel. There are Nixie lights that come off, and when I took the flash picture, I can wipe out, but normally you can see the numbers. Uh, you enter the positions of the object. And I just proved I really was there. The picture obviously is bold because I didn't punch in the numbers. There was a night assistant that does all that work. And this was the computer that ran the telescope. And what got one of the major things that got me when I was there, uh, this was an 80. And at that time, I had a Radio Shack TRS-80 uh, computer, which had 48K memory, which in that day I was in heaven. I mean, this computer had 32K memory. <laughs> and the idea that an individual in the United States could buy and have for himself a computer that would be better than the one running with six meter, well, so that's something to think about. All right, uh, if you remember the diagram, there were two platforms right and left. Those are called Mazda platforms after the designer and the uh, design. And on one of the platforms, uh, they 
have the Surrey Post, and here's the eyepiece uh, to look in through the field of view. And this is funny too, because my first night, I uh, had a position of a RML branch star that I was observing. And so the night assistant set it up, and he asked me to kind of look at the eyepiece to make sure that the right star was on the field. And so I looked through, and here is this hazy patch. And the rumor is through the external community was that the telescope was no good, no focus, no nothing. And I was mentally saying to myself, oh my god, it's true. Well, luckily all it was, I wear glasses, and I was just a bit of a slight twist on the eyepiece from all the well. <laughs> uh, this is, on the other side, uh, there are a whole set of spectrographs. And uh, here are two, uh, I think there's six all together. And you can aim the light beam so you take the cover off and you can aim it so it goes on any number of grades so you can pick what the surge of one spectrum is to be. And then up on the platform, uh, again, you've got to guide to make sure the star stays on the slit of the spectrum or in the counter. And uh, so here's a little paddle which moves the telescope in out to the plasma. So it's a little trickier because with a, an equatorial, usually all you do is you hit east or west because the air is here a little fast or a little slow. Uh, in this case, you've got to hit both altitude and azimuth because it's a complex uh, business of both. But it, it works very well. All right, so here is the, um, on the observing post, again, there's another panel where we can control the position. And uh, here is a picture of the star. And this is looking at the slit of the uh, spectrograph. And uh, these are, they're flat cosmic rays. They get all sorts of flashes. So again, I'm saying here's the deal. And this is looking at the uh, slit. And there is Samos, my collaborator. And here we all are. Uh, Christ East is a Lithuanian astronomer that I've been working with for 20 years or more. And uh, there am I, there is Samos, and this was an astronomer at the uh, observatory. Helped us quite a lot. For this picture, I just put the camera face up on the uh, platform, and uh, this went up open. So the star is straight up a little bit. And this is to give you a scale factor. There was a little arc that rolled up and down the outside of the slip. And so I got in there near sunset. And so I'm six feet tall. And uh, you can see the, of course, the mirror is not that big. It's in a meter inside to give you a scale factor. All right, now what I was doing, I was taking spectra of horizontal branch stars and quadrant clusters, and I don't have time to explain what all that is. Some of you hopefully were at my HR diagram talk, so you know a little bit. But uh, for an A-type star, the major features are the hydrogen lines. So we have this, 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 this. And here's another line interspersed, and that's a line due to cal ionized calcium. And uh, I was measuring mainly the calcium line in a lot of uh, horizontal branch stars and water clusters. And what I can do is I can compare the strength of that line to a normal population one star in the field of our galaxy. And what you find is it's always much weaker than a normal star in our galaxy. And the, what's going on here is the water clusters forming first. They were formed of material that has very little metals. In astronomy, there's X, Y, and Z. X is the hydrogen abundance, Y is the helium abundance, Z is the abundance of everything else. So when I say metals, I mean Z. So all the other elements are way, way down. And uh, for a normal population, one star, then they'll be much stronger, and the thousand line will be stronger. And here's a plot of uh, the strength of the calcium line. And, uh, Here's the color of the star. This line is the population one normal relation. That's how strong the calcium line should be for 
or star of that color. And then here with the measures of my horizontal branch stars, and as you can see, they're well bound, so that relates to the low metal levels. All right, now, although this is not one of the largest telescopes, it certainly is rated as one of the best. So I have some slides of the Hubble. This obviously is a, a drawing. Uh, where would you be? And here is the ill fated mirror, which was so terribly manufactured. And there is a diagram of the uh, telescope. Uh, of the power is gained from the sun hitting the solar cells. And, uh, again, there's not enough time to go through all the instruments uh, for it. And here, uh, this shows you how the information gets back so the data are set up to a Pedro satellite and bounced down, sent to another satellite, and finally they get to the Space Telescope Institute in Baltimore, and here is a person at a console, and so the Hubble was taking a picture of the galaxy, and there it is. <laughs> All right, so this uh, shows what happens with the mirror. The idea was that uh, if you had a single star image, you would have a profile like this. And with the astromatic mirror, what you had instead was this. And so for the first few years, all the pictures were graded. And they could do some fancy tricks. Like uh, if, you can, if you have pictures of some brighter stars, you can cut the uh, information off right there and then work just that part. So some sharp pictures were taken, but of course everybody's interested in all the faint objects, and there's no way uh, if you have to use all the image, then your resolution is gone. Uh, you can't tell where the object is. Here is a uh, cluster taken, and uh, here is taken with the Hubble. So the first picture was from the ground, and here uh, is much better resolved. And of course this was with the astigmatic mirror. So nowadays they're taking pictures that are far better. Um, here's a ground-based uh, image of uh, a bunch of objects. You, may, you can tell because it's not a circular image that something is going on there. But with the Hubble, then you can see, well, there's a nice complex of stars there. Uh, that's an upside down, but it doesn't matter. Uh, here is Pluto and its moon, uh, Charon. And from the ground, you get this hazy picture here. Uh, you really can see what's going on. And here's a gravitational lens. If you have some object that's very, very far away, and then in the line of sight, there are, say, the galaxy, a massive object. If you study uh, Einstein's laws, is the light that's broken up, and you get four uh, images. It's called the Einstein cross. And uh, so this is a nice proof that this theory is correct. And here's a picture of a uh, core of a galaxy, ground based. And, uh, take a look. Okay, so now we can switch over. Yeah. 
done that is instance above the Earth's atmosphere, then they can study the ultraviolet radiation. And for the types of stars I'm working on, that's a very important region. So I get the uh, ultraviolet spectra of the uh, horizontal branch stars. So this has been one of the major success stories in American uh, observatories that really performed well. And here's IRAS, that's another satellite that is uh, working in the infrared. Sorry. 
36 mirror is there hexagonal. So there's one hexagon in the middle, then there's a ring of hexagons, and another, and another. And so you have, uh, you grind the middle one on one plant, the next ring are ground on another uh, regime because they put it out on the parabolic part. And what they did was, for each ring, they had built an extra mirror. And in the actual observatory dome, there is a real on the uh, drum. And so the plan is, what they're doing, is they're always recoding one of those mirrors. And since they have spares for every machine, they can, whichever mirror is dirtiest, they can take it out, uh, clean it, recode it, and they put in a replacement. So the telescope is always able to work with a full complement. And that way, the telescope is always kept. All right then, uh, Magellan, uh, here's another consortium, uh, an eight meter uh, telescope. Now, here is uh, NAO South and North. That, uh, now the name has changed, it's called Gemini. And these are two eight meter telescopes, uh, North and South. So uh, one of them is not so far north, but it's going in a line, and you can see the uh, northern skies. And the other one is going in Chile, uh, not on certain Lola, but the next mountain over. So these two telescopes then will cover the entire uh, sky. And uh, the United States is the major partner, but then uh, the UK, Canada, uh, Brazil, Chile, Argentina, and it's interesting in astronomy now to uh, say Higgins type thing. It's the best and the worst of time. The best part is that we are now building telescopes and new instruments that are so much better than anything we've ever had before. The possibilities for getting astronomy are just superb. The bad part is the financial support for these activities is drying up. Young people coming into the field are just not going to have the opportunity that I did to uh, get time on the telescope. And as an example, Gemini uh, is the perfect example of what's going on. At Kit Peak, the plan for the year 2000 is to shut the mountain section down and keep only the 4 meter and this new Yale uh, 3 and a half meter telescope. All the other telescopes will be shut. And the reason is. Congress and its infinite wisdom granted money to build the system, which is very nice. But the budget to run the observatory has not increased to the decrease. And so something has to go. And I know in Canada, where I go, I go to DAO, the Dominion Aspen Observatory, a couple times a year to work. And in Canada, uh, they're going to be a Gemini shop. Japanese, uh, the aperture rates always go on. Uh, this is a slide that is some years old. That 7.5 has somehow gotten up to 8.2, I think. Uh, and here, this is a very interesting case. The MMT, they have the dome, the observatory, and if you put a one surface 6.5 meter glass in there, the telescope will be far better than when it had six in the clear about the year losing all the space in between. And so uh, they got support from NSF and the University of Arizona has a very nice, Roger Angel has a very nice telescope on the American manufacturing lab and they have already made uh, the uh, mirror. So in a few years, the MMT will be a much larger All right, so let's talk a little bit about the uh, Keck. Um, Sky and Telescope is a very good source for finding out what's going on in astronomy. And so 
so uh, here's a picture. There's the uh, first one all done, and here's the second one in the stage of being built. And here's where modern technology helps. Here are scales of a number of observatories. So the domes are all the scale. And then the telescopes are all the scale. But the uh, telescopes are not scaled to the dome. But anyway, they, 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 as you run across. So you see the keg is done very well because it's you know, one of the smaller domes, but it is by far the largest uh, here. And when you get into these very large uh, telescopes, the domes cost millions of dollars. And if you can cut the size down by a factor of two, the usual rule is when you're building something like this, if you double the size, the cost goes up by an order of magnitude. So it's a real economic factor.
education is coming along. And uh, I gave a talk yesterday on CCDs. Uh, here is a CCD, is a little thing there. And so what you have is a uh, ship of silicon. Silicon has the property, the photons hit it, uh, electrons come off, and uh, you can uh, store those electrons. And let's say we expose that chip for 20 minutes on some stellar field. You then shut the shutter, and you then read it off by moving the uh, under software control. You can move the charge one row over. And so that means the charge that is on this edge gets pushed off, and you have a device that reads what the charge is in each one. And so that goes into the computer as row one. Then you move it one more row, and row two comes off, and that goes into the computer. And so when you've read everything off, you now have in the computer a nice grid which gives you the intensity on each pixel. And uh, with the workstation, you can then uh, give a command, and that all comes back up. On the screen, there you have a picture. It looks just like a photograph. But the beauty of this one is that if you have a photograph uh, and you try to relate intensity to the density of the photograph, you have a, a toe, a straight line portion, and then a shoulder. And although you can solve all that and get magnitudes, it's a complex process and you have some <coughs> errors in doing it. If you do the same thing with a CCD, you have a straight line or it's like six magnitudes, and it's good to it's like 0.01%. So it's perfect. And all you need to do is get a few stars and you know the magnitudes and calibrate your plot. And so now you can come in uh, with some magnitude you measure off, and you read down, that is the magnitude of the star. So it, it works uh, very, very well. And that turns small telescopes into large telescopes, large telescopes into things that one can even imagine before. Now, what's going on here is you always want to cover more and more area. And uh, they now can make 2K chips, 2,000 pixels by 2,000 pixels. They've tried to make 4K chips, and although they can make them, the yield is too small. You might get only 1% of them come true. And so what they're doing now is, since the 2K chips can be made very nicely, you can make a mosaic where you put four of them together. And I've seen you know, their mosaics where you have two by three. So that way you can uh, cover a large area of sky at the same time. And here's another technique. So, it turns out that in the atmosphere of the Earth, there is a layer of sodium atoms a number of miles up. And if you shoot a laser, a strong laser beam up, you will create an artificial star. And so what you do is you can aim the beam close to the object you're interested in. And you will then focus your telescope on that object. And the modern telescopes have several controls at the back of the mirror. So they can actually perform the mirror in real time. And if the atmosphere of turbulence suddenly changes things, the mirror can be changed so it takes that into account. And uh, when you get everything going, then uh, you can take your exposure of the object you want. And this has been a tremendous tool. In fact, I, there are now pictures taken with some of these new telescopes with this system on board that uh, rival the Hubble. I mean, you can take pictures almost as good as Hubble. And when you uh, think that the Hubble up here estimates as high as $2 billion for that episode, and the costs are still going on, an installation like this is around a million. So it's not, I mean, not everybody can put a million dollars into the observatory, but uh, you can do some of them, and for that modest cost, relative to $2 billion, you can do extremely good astronomy. So uh, I hope the talk then has shown you some of the past larger telescopes plans and new telescopes that have come into being, and I've shown you some of the new techniques that uh, make the use of them better. And I think with your telescope that's on exhibit today, if that were set up in a little observatory somewhere on campus or close by, there are the CCD kits that you can 
five or a few hundred. And so that telescope could be turned into an instrument that students could use and work of research quality could be done. Students could publish papers and pass off the journals and be able to record and really good work. And then also the other possibility is a telescope like that could be used for public nights, bring in the people in Burlington and around. And an example I can give, I went to Case Institute and there was a man, Jason Nassau, who was there for forever. And uh, over the years, he built up the Cleveland Astronomical Society. And when I was there as a student, they had a policy, they bring eight uh, PhD astronomers from outside, and the man or woman would give a medical talk, and then they would have a meeting. And over the years, that grew to be some hundreds of Cleveland people, some of whom were quite well off. And uh, a large amount of money over the years was donated back to that group. Uh, there's a fund to help publish papers. Uh, the Schmidt Telescope had to be moved from Cleveland out to outside the city. And so that group uh, really helped. And I think you have here in the nucleus that there's somebody who's interested in playing a part of Jason Nassau. Uh, there's no reason why you could do the same thing. So if there are any questions, Thank you. 